All right, we have a scripture to start off with. So we have that scripture up? Yeah. All right, so here's our scripture. We give you a scripture periodically for you to focus on. It'll help us with our sermon. It says, for if by one man's offense, talking about Adam, death reigned through one, much more those who received abundance of grace. That's you. Everyone say abundance of grace. All right. All right. And much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life. Did you know God designed for you to reign and not to be a victim? Smile at somebody. Say, thank God I'm not a victim. All right. So let me share something with you that I, I want to share. And that's this. It's always important that you start your day off and your walk off correct with the Lord. Say amen. amen. So we know that in the scripture, I like to share a truth before a truth. In the scripture, the Bible says that we are to allow Jesus to be first in our life. We are to make him first. He's like a king that we ask him to come and sit down in our heart. To honor him and to respect him is the beginning of wisdom, Proverbs says. Can you say amen? So here's some truths before the truths. You were designed and to reign in life in Christ Jesus. God did not design for us to be a product of Adam's fall. But nevertheless, we were thrown into Adam's fall. But Jesus Christ, the last Adam, came and provided for us a means where we can be restored into that fellowship and we can walk with God just like Adam and Eve did in the beginning. So let me share a truth with you that Satan's muddled up a lot. Did you know when you get born again, you accept God as your Lord and Savior. God, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit comes in you. Now how long ago did he crush Satan's head? Over 2,000 years ago. And he gave that victory and deposited that victory in your heart. So guess what? You start off absolutely free in Christ. Well, then why, Pastor, do we have problems later on? Because we start taking over control again instead of staying surrendered to God. Now, listen to me carefully, very carefully. It spent 40-plus years trying to teach you this thing accurately. So it isn't us living for God. It's God living through us for him. In other words, it says to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But that is work it out with God, not work it out by yourself. Because without God, we can't live up to it. Remember, the law was given to show us we can't save ourselves. And Christians today are trying their best to save themselves and to keep themselves from sinning. Well, you, you've got the, the horses behind the cart. They're not supposed to push the cart. They're supposed to pull you. You need to hook up with Jesus. So he pulls you through life, teaching you step by step through the way so that you may enjoy life to its fullness. Now, I'm not to say that you won't have a trial or you won't have some tribulations. But if you go back and you go through that in your mind, you'll find out that's when you stepped out of the car at 55 miles an hour and rolled in the gravel. <laughs> God didn't do that. He's not trying to teach you something. I'm going to teach you not to get out of the car by throwing you out of the car. <laughs> we have such mad, crazy teaching out there that is not stable. God wants us stable, right? What did he say? That our foot would be on, our feet would be on a rock that cannot be moved. All right. Shoot. You ready to be with me? Now listen. A couple of more things. Number one. How many here knows the difference between gossip? Oh boy, here we go. And tail bearing. This is just a supplement. Gossip is talking about somebody in a critical way with somebody when he's not there. So try to avoid that. Everyone say amen. amen. But here's the sneaky one Satan throws into Christians. Remember, it's the little foxes sometimes that frustrate. Remember, God's going to help you with all of this. He helps me with it. Tail bearing is another thing. When you t bear a tail, I mean, you'll read about how the messenger came to David and said, Jonathan was dead. And he kind of said it mockingly. Finally, Saul's, you know, 
forgetting that David had made a covenant with Jonathan. And, jo and so David turned right around and had him killed. Why? Because he was disrespectful. Hello, are you with me? Thank God we're in the New Testament. And so basically, we need to realize that sometimes a message needs to be good. I asked the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't want my life to be shortened. So how can I change? How can you change my message so it encourages your people without them thinking I'm just an old encourager and I can't talk about discipline, you know? <laughs> We kind of have a tendency to put pastors in boxes, don't we? Amen. If it gets a little hot in here, everybody go like that, and we'll get an usher to take care of all that. All right, so so catch yourself. When you bear a, bear a tale, you can bear a tale about yourself that's not good. How many here know that when you come to a church, you shouldn't tell everybody about your past? Are you forgiven? Don't. Dig up fluffy. So bearing a tale is saying something to another person, which actually doesn't edify them by telling them. So you could bear a tale about yourself. You know, I used to be a drug addict. I used to do, I used to, I used to, I used to do all that. You see, there's no glory of God in that. So I'm bearing a tale about myself. Now, if you get somebody who's never had a problem like that, like my lively wife, she'll look at me, she says, I'm not sure I want to marry you. <laughs> So sometimes we bear tales that we shouldn't. So the little supplement is watch your mouth because this is where the power leaks out. If you want to be a Christian that's full of power, don't open thy mouth and insert thy foot. Say amen. Do your best. And just say, well, Lord, help me with that. Amen. Now, a lot of Christians sit in the congregation and if they hear something that, that sort of fits them, Immediately Satan says, yeah, that's you, and he's looking right at you. I never do that. I just speak the word. I tell exactly what God has me to tell on a Sunday morning. Trouble is, it usually is our mail. <laughs> so basically watch that because I want you to grow in power. I want you to grow in your effectiveness. When you pray for the sick, I want to see them recover because God says you could. He's the one that heals them, but we're the one that blocks that power by what we just loosely say all the time. So look at your neighbor and say, death and life are in my tongue. And I can control my life through it. Didn't it say your tongue's a rudder? Your tongue's a steering wheel? And those that let God tame the tongue, you'll literally steer your life into success. Hmm, I never got that out of James. Well, that's because we always read the negative and we forget there's a positive too. God set before us life and what? Death. Then what did he say? For us to what? He, he didn't leave us there. He says, choose life and I'm going to help you. Isn't that great? I want you to close your eyes for a minute and just think how much God really loves you. How many here know that yesterday's gone? That means you're forgiven. Amen. And just soak up the fact that God loves you. He's looking out for your best. He's helping to trim your life so that it doesn't become wasteful. And help guide your steps so you're fulfilled. Amen. How many here at the end of your life, you want God to look at you and say, Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Amen. All right, so you ready? Here's my sec second little thing. God wants obedient children, not just children. Think about it. Why would God want us to be obedient? Well, it helps us, but also helps him get the, the, his will done in the earth. And did you know that God is waiting for the last person to say, Jesus, come into my heart and forgive me of my sin, and poof, we're out of here. Maybe you are that person that share that with that last person. God knows who they are. And you go say, well, how do we know it's the last person? Why don't you just start sharing with everybody? And whew, you might win the lotto. <laughs> I went and laughed myself silly. <laughs> Is it okay to be a happy pastor? Is it okay to know your notes and experience the word? Is that okay? Is it okay to love you so much to pray for you every day? 
Okay, then I'll move right along. <laughs> All right. Amen. Okay, so if you and I are designed to reign in life, this is my notes. We're designed to reign under a wonderful God who's perfect. Say God is perfect. So first thing as a young Christian is remember everything God does is perfect. So if you've got a thought, somebody suggests something that God is doing maybe in your behalf that is not perfect, guess what? Put your foot down and say, no, I only accept everything good and perfect from the Father of lights in whom there's no variableness, no shadow of turning. Christians today don't know how to discern what comes into their life, but instead of just whatever will be, will be. The future is not ours to say. Case or all. And Christians live that way. No, no, no. You start your day off meeting with the captain of your salvation, talking to him, getting the instructions for the day. God might have you do something that is incredibly wonderful. And how are you going to get those instructions? I would venture to say many Christians today experience God, but it's usually by accident. They, somehow some formula comes together, BJ, and boom, they get a result. And they go, wow, isn't that great? Not knowing that God says, anyone that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. Woohoo! I like to sit down with the creator of heaven and earth. I like to sit down. Now, not because I'm anything special. Because there was a time I thought I couldn't. So you and I were designed to reign in life under the wonderful God and Savior. Genesis 1.26. Yet we were thrown into a curse through Adam. In a broken, fallen world. This world is broken and fallen. So when you walk through it, you walk through with God. Don't try to skip on through life thinking life is just going to hand you stuff. No, you and God have to literally navigate through your steps. If you don't, you're liable to marry somebody you're ashamed of. Hello, you're liable to do something that will haunt you. God forbid. You're liable to join the army when God didn't want you to. Just joking, nothing wrong with that. You guys look up at me, smile. You don't feel like uh, uh, you're under the weather, do you? Good, because you shouldn't be under the circumstances. You should be above them in Christ. Say amen. And if you're not, let's get you there. Amen. All right, so I don't know about you, but I never wanted to be part of that team. You know, when they pick the team, pick team A, pick team B, I never wanted to be the last on the list. Amen. And you're not last on the list. Can you say amen? All right, so let's go on a little further. He says, listen, remember one of the first impulses that Adam and Eve had when they fell. Do you remember what it was? Hide. When you make a mistake, don't hide from God. Go right to him and say, God, whoops. As terrible and as nasty as it is, you'll find relief. And you'll find forgiveness. And after I share with you today who you're supposed to be, you'll find out any day without God is going to be a day you need forgiveness. <laughs> Did you hear how I said it? Any day that you don't take God and walk with God in it, you're going to have a day of unforgiveness. You're going to have to get forgiveness for it. Why? Because your flesh does not want to serve God. Your flesh wants to get angry. Your flesh wants to prove its point. Your flesh wants to mouth off. In fact, for pastors, our flesh, when we get in the flesh, God forbid, we want to control the traffic. We want to control the traffic because supposedly we can see what's good for you. But did you know that's a trespass? My job is not to tell you what to do. My job is to give you the word and encourage you to do it. I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life that you and your seed may what? God wants you to live in. He wants you to express in that life. Man, what happened to you? I went to service today. 
I heard about what my inheritance is. I heard about how much God loves me. I didn't hear about what's wrong with me all the time. I heard about what God can do when I spend time with him, how he can restore me, and he can put me together. Hey, Humpty Dumpty. God's got your eggshells. Can you say amen? All right, moving right along. Go with me to Romans chapter 8. We do give out notes. If you request a note for next service, you say, I'd like to have the notes. We'll print up some extra for you, okay? Now, I don't follow my notes too much. I, I basically do, and they're up there. But sometimes when we take notes, we miss what's said. So try, if you're like that, like I used to be, I held the notes and just brought a recorder. <laughs> Hello. How many here, when you go to Bible college, you go to like eight classes a day. How much of that are you going to retain? Hey, recorder. Amen. <laughs> it helped me a lot. I'm sure a lot of you have done it too. All right, so Romans 8, look at this now. I love the New King James in Romans 8. The NIV skips this part and repeats it farther down but loses the point. I believe the point should be brought up first so you know what's going to be covered. Can you say amen? And the King James, or which is translated from the Texas Receptives. Look, there's a lot of wonderful Bibles. I'm not picking one favorite over the other. I just picked this one because it didn't remove some statements that I was used to. I was brought up in the King James. So, no, the King James is not the only Bible. It's not too much of that stuff being preached instead of the Bible. Can you say amen? So they skipped this first phrase. In, in the NIV, but it's still written in there. So, but let me emphasize this. It says here at Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is now, everyone say now, not tomorrow, not yesterday. Right now, when you're with God, there is what? No condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now, again, remember the little words. Little words are so important because they locate us. If it we're in the car, where are we? Right? Now, I'm going to repeat things like this till you get it when you read it. If I'm in Christ, then where am I? Well, then why are we so more aware of where we're sitting now than we are aware of God who we're in? Yeah, well, it could be a lot of things. But the idea is that's the key that you become more aware of God wherever you are than you are aware of other things in the negative. I have to say that in the negative. You need to be aware you're in a car. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? All right. I'm having fun with it. You learning anything? Let's get into this. It says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Now look at the next phrase. Who walk not after the... So... Whether you know this now or not, or not, you will know it now, okay? There are two of you sitting right there. There's you, your spiritual and soulish person, the real you, and their earth suit that you have brought along with you. The earth suit does not want to serve God. That's why it can't go to heaven like it is. That's why the blood can't be accepted. That's why if any man's walking in the flesh, Romans 8, 8, cannot please God. Doesn't matter what good you do in the flesh, what bad you do in the flesh, if it's just out of the flesh and not out of your heart, it scores zip diddle. It's nothing. For to be carnally minded, it says in Romans 8, is death. But to be spiritually minded, set your mind on things above, is life and peace. Amen. Romans 8, 5. So therefore, there is no condemnation. Say no condemnation. So never go to church feeling condemned. Because there's no condemnation. God will not give you any condemnation. Maybe the person you were irritated would. Or, or maybe the devil will kind of lay some trip on your heart. Well, pastor looked at you too much during his sermon. Maybe he thinks you're suffering. You know, if I, if I look at you and I say, do you need prayer? That doesn't mean... I want to embarrass you. That means I see your countenance is just a little drained. So tank up. Can you say amen? Tank up. You're hooked to, the, to God. Can you say amen? All right. So you still with me? All right. So who walk not after the flesh. 
Notice the term after. Walk after. When you walk after your dog, who's leading? When you're walking after your flesh, who's leading? So, we should be walking after who? God. Amen. Spirit, God, same thing. You know, so when you read the scripture, you've got to understand the setting, who it's applying to, and the historical means and why which it's applied, and how it applies to you. So when you say, I'm walking in the spirit, you're walking in God. And when you say you're walking in God, you're walking in the spirit. We're walking with Christ. We're walking in the spirit. So don't fall over synonymous words, okay? Different little knickknacks. Just realize there's two of you. They have a flesh suit and you have the real you. The real you is craving a greater relationship with God. And the flesh you wants to sit down, sleep in, and don't show up at church. And so the devil goes, see you wouldn't have those thoughts if you were really saved. I heard something when I was traveling here a couple of weeks ago. And that was, if somebody's really saved, then they won't have trouble in the flesh. Do you know that's a false teaching? It's very much false teaching. Because there's plenty of Christians that really love God, but they don't know how to overcome. You see? So why not teach them the word so they can apply it with God's help to overcome? But what Satan does is he keeps them challenged, keeps them thinking about themselves. So they think, if I go to church, somebody's going to understand that I need help and they're going to point me out. What was the first thing Adam did when after he had sinned? He hid himself. And then God says, have you eaten of that tree? You know the story. And then, of course, his, his brilliant answer was, it was the woman you gave me, God. Started blaming. Listen, Christians, take the blame, even if there isn't any. Somebody says, you, know, you did this, I'm really sorry, forgive me. There's no argument in that. Then somebody who's really spiritual might say, well, don't take the blame. Because then it's, you're acting guilty when you're not. Get out of here. Get back into here. Because as long as you try to serve God from your head, you're going to blow it. Hello. I mean, one guy said it to me. He says, you know, Carrie, after your preaching, I discovered that if I understand all there is to know about God here, then now God is too small to handle my problems. We're not supposed to understand him with our mind. We're supposed to accept him with our heart and believe that he's absolutely perfect. So everything he does with us is what? So couldn't you relax with somebody like that? If the ground's trembling around you, 10,000 fall at your left hand, right? 5,000 fall at your right hand. Are you going to be moved? No, because you're right in the bosom of God. It's only a person who has too many investments in the earth gets nervous after the earthquake. Moving right along. It's, you guys are eating this up. I can tell. It's going right out of me. You're sucking all this word out of me. Great. You ever been to a church where it all bounces back? <laughs> it's like playing, you know, racquetball. <laughs> I played racquetball with a guy that's so good, he literally made me dance. He was so... <laughs> Forget about all that stuff. You know what I mean? <laughs> I didn't know you could do that with a false leg, Pastor Kay. I didn't either. Let's move right along. All right, so listen. And it says, for the law of the spirit of life. Listen, the law of the spirit capital S, of life has made me free from the law of sin and death. So you are free from sin and death. Amen? You are free. Now, don't let the devil talk you into some. The thief comes to what? Steal, kill, and destroy. So if you get born again and you receive God's victory, did you? Yes. So everything that Jesus did, you have in your heart. Did you? Yes. So Satan knows if you discover what that is, 
You're going to beat the tar. Well, uh, every time you get up in the morning, you're going to beat the tar out of him. Why? Because you'll learn to turn God loose who lives in your heart. And he's already defeated the devil. Once the devil's been smashed, he runs from the light. And God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So turn on the light. Don't turn on your wisdom. <laughs> turn on your light. Ding, ding. How many ever been stumbling around a campsite and you needed a light? Amen. Matches don't seem to work. All right. You know, strike a little sulfur there. Let's get going. All right. A couple of things. The world offers false hope, does it not? Oh, you're going to get all cured. We got something for you. You can receive. Go cure you. Oh, it didn't really cure you. Well, oops, stop. When we lean to the flesh of man, you're going to see flaws. We do look to medicines and doctors. That's all good. But the Bible says we don't put our eyes on the world system. We put our eyes on the good of the earth. There's a difference. God gave the earth to us. It's supposed to minister to us. You have a home or an apartment that sits on the earth. That God is provided. The world system is not God's. It's what Satan does. It's designed to tell God, hey, look at these dummies called Christians. They think they got it together. I'm going to show you that they only think of themselves by building a world system that will draw them away. And it says in 1 John, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For all that is the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, these are of the flesh and of the world. And the world is passing away. But he who does the will of God shall abide forever. Woohoo, Brian, that's us! So the next time the devil threatens you, you say, hey, you got to take it up with Almighty God. And he's on my side because I'm his kid. Now, that's not a brag. That's just a fact. There's one thing when you're bragging and you're trying to convince the devil you're this because you're not convinced yourself. Another thing is you just quote him the word and he can't argue with it. God, did you know I'm your anointed and Satan hasn't figured that out. So next time he comes, I'm going to let him know I'm God's anointed. You better not touch me because if you touch me, you're touching God. He that's done it under the least of my little ones have done it under me. You see the weaponry at your disposal? Remember, Satan's a con artist. He will talk you out of what you have. You have absolute victory. You have absolute, absolute taken care of. But he will steal it all from you because he gets you from the heart into the head. You're directing traffic and trying to tell your wife what to do. You're directing traffic and trying to tell all this what to do instead of letting God tell you what should be done so you can do it as an obedient child. Someone say amen. All right. The law of the spirit of life already in you, if you're born again, has set you free from the law of sin and death. So when Satan accuses you, you just smile and say, God's got that. Don't try to justify Hear the little words in your head. I'm going to again say this until this becomes so normal to you. These little words come through your head that tells you you're a jerk. Well, there you go again and tells you, puts you down. Will God ever put you down? Not in the New Testament. He does it in the Old Testament because they didn't have God in them. So they were evil still. That's why Jesus called his disciples. You being evil, you can give good gifts to your children. How much more your heavenly father who is absolutely perfect, absolutely good, can give chips. So receive God in you so you can do it God's way. Amen. Somebody said one time, Pastor Kerry, it's really hard to sit under your teaching because I feel so convicted. Don't feel convicted. Feel encouraged. I had a brother. I love this brother with all my heart. None of you know him. And we were saved together. And years ago, he would say to me, every time I open my Bible, God rebukes me. And then he turns to me and he says like this, isn't that good? And I looked at him, I said, well, it depends. If you're really out of order, it's good. 
But if you're not, don't look for God to rebuke you. Look for God to help you in every area. Just ask him. You have not because we ask not. So if you say, God, I'm okay. Would you just spend your time with those that really need you? You're in trouble. Because there's not a person in the world that doesn't need God every day all day long to help us out of this prison called the world system. It's a prison, folks. You in Adam were thrown into prison. Jesus kicked the doors open and pardoned you, but some of us are still sitting in there thinking the doors are locked. Because Satan and our flesh tells us, you're never going to be anything. That little squiggly thoughts through your mind. You could be praying all of a sudden. You got this gross thought that come flying through your mind. Oh my God, I've sinned. That's what I used to think when I was a baby Christian. I've sinned. God, forgive me. Forgive me. Oh, I've sinned. And God says, you did what? I said, well, this creepy thought went. Do you think you thought that? Well, no. Where do you think it came from? The enemy. Now, the enemy can't read your mind. He reads your reactions to his thought injections. He says, you're a slob. (laughs) Because we're not secure. I'm not relating to you. Come on, you're all relating to this. Your mind tells you you're a slob, you're a joke. You don't need anybody else to tell you. If that's so, you know who's trying to creep through their little, and you're starting to make a little nest. You want that to stop? How many would like stuff like that to stop? Just say, thank you, Jesus. As soon as you say that, man, he splits. The the thoughts are gone. And you go, wow. Man, try it sometime. Think in your head, count one to ten real slowly. And then out loud, speak your name or say, thank you, Lord. Your whole counting and your whole thinking will stop to hear what your mouth is saying. Thoughts will die unborn if you don't speak them. And if they're negative thoughts, don't speak them. We want to tell how people, how we're embarrassed. So we tell all our friends, you know, I'm a complete idiot. It's all, it's all, it's all. Yeah, would you come to my church and listen to my preaching? I'm a complete idiot. And that's how some of us talk. No, listen, if you haven't got anything good to say, be quiet. Smile a lot. If you're on work and they want to argue about politics or something, just smile and say, hey, got to go get a glass of water. Don't get entangled in the affairs of this world because it's this world's passing away. If you get entangled in it, then God's got to untangle you. So we do. We, we, I, I have this thing called invite myself into somebody else's business. God had to deliver me. Amen. My job is not to direct your life. My job is to just give you the word, pray for you so that you catch the word and you do the word and you get the results of the word and God gets the credit, not Pastor Kerry. Please keep your eyes off of me. I'm just a man. And I donated part of me. So I'm part of a man. Can you guys laugh? You can't really know how to segue yourself. Have you ever laughed at yourself? If you don't laugh at yourself, others will. Move right on. (coughs) All right. Our flesh is not going to make it. So don't invest a lot of time in it. Hello. Your flesh says, do this. They said, no, not until I want to. Somebody says, well, Pastor Kerry, this is when I was really surprised. I'm going to hear no Marilyn Hickey. I got a chance to preach with Marilyn Hickey in Casey Tree Church years ago. I hosted the, the, the Casey Tree Convention with Marilyn Hickey years ago. It's hard for you to imagine that. And I'm standing around, and one of the questions I wanted to ask, and that's a really serious question. Remember, I'm probably only about 10, 15 years old in the Lord. I'm really having a big ministry already. They, everybody wanted me to be a hero. Don't let anybody do that to you. There's only one hero. Only one good. 
you know, and I asked Marilyn, I said, Marilyn, there's a lot of issue going on right now whether Christians should drink or not. What's your, what do you say to, say to them? Because I know she doesn't drink. She says, this is what I tell them, and it usually mellows them out. She says, I drink all I want. I just don't want. Because God has control of my life, and I can't justify drinking something that's not going to make me me, but it's going to make me look like an idiot. So, so if you want a beer, I'm not saying you should, but if, have a beer, but have it in faith, have it in Jesus' name, but stop there before you become a bubbling idiot. Hey, drummers, rock and roll bands, do you think I drank? Yes, and you know, when I drank, I was a bubbling idiot. <laughs> I love you so much. You know, doesn't that look spiritual? So can't you laugh at ourselves? Sure we can. Here's a little key for you. Happy is the man that don't condemn himself and that which he allows. In other words, if you need to take medicine, don't let the devil condemn you for that. If you need extra sleep, because that's just how your makeup is, don't let the devil compare. If you don't worship on a Saturday, don't let people condemn you for that. It's all through scripture. All the scripture is written for preventative medicine, not for us to keep doing the same thing over and over again and getting hardened and our conscience seared with a hot iron. Everyone say, no, no, no. But I am a new creature in Christ. I'm a God species creature now. And that's why Satan wants to snuff us. He'd love to snuff somebody like me. Because he'll knock down 47 years of teaching. He'd love for him to trip you up. Because then everybody who thought that you were somebody now knows that you're nobody. So he works on us to try to ruin our testimony. But see, our testimony is only before two. Love the Lord thy God with all your mind, heart, soul, and strength. And New Testament eyes to love your neighbor as I have loved you. Old Testament, as you love yourself. But in New Testament, as I in you love you. So we love our enemies with the love that God put in our heart. We love our country with the, God, with the love that God put in our heart. We love each other with the love that God has put in our heart as it is written. And the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Accepted in Christ. Everyone say, God accepts me because I accepted his son. Lock, stock, and barrel. That means he, he took you just the way you were. Aren't you glad? Now, here's the problem. So that means, well, God, I accepted you years ago. And if I ever change my mind, I'll let you know. No, 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 no. Are you with me? You're accepted. So God doesn't look at you as disdained. You make a mistake, he doesn't look at you as you're a creep. And yet I've talked to hundreds of Christians when I was away from the body of Christ, traveling with my mom with Lou Gehrig's disease, and asked them, why aren't you back in church? And he says, well, because church people are always judging and always interfering and all that. And just don't leave me alone to just love God. I want to go to a place where I can love God, I can be myself and love God, and I can learn about him so I can live a good life. And people just get in the way. Have you ever had somebody? Now, well, raise your hand. Purposely, you know, was not of God, confronted you or said something about you in church, and there was the temptation for you to leave and never come back. Now, would that be a good choice? How many know that? Now, listen to me churches are hospitals for the sick. Come on, you want to find a date there? Love with me. My first wife I found in a bar. That wasn't good either. You know, she wasn't a bad person. She got saved before I did. Bless her heart. Why do you say first wife? Because there are millions of Christians have gone through something they want forgiveness for. And listen, if you are a part of a denomination that once you get divorced, 
you committed the unpardonable sin, that is a lie from the pit of hell. How many sins did Jesus forgive us of? The thing that he doesn't want us to do is to get a wife one week and don't like her and then get another one next week. <laughs> God forbid you need prayer. <laughs> like me, I was an entertainer. I had four or five a day. So what does that do for a man trying to love a faithful wife when all the women are unfaithful? It tears you up. And I just happen to be a real handsome, cute guy. So moving right along. <laughs> My wife's smiling. All right. Can you laugh? Are you guys here today? Okay, so let's give you some more to digest on. All right, so say I'm accepted, whether you like me or not. Okay, so let's listen to what God's word says. Ephesians chapter 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God, the Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who hath, past tense, blessed us with every spiritual blessing. In the higher realm, in the heavenly place. Higher realm means your spiritual realm. Remember there's two of you. Flesh you, spiritual you. So when we're operating in the spiritual you, we get our hands on the spiritual things. When we're operating in the flesh, the spirit resists the flesh. Give grace to the humble. Or let me put it the way it's written. The spirit resists the proud flesh. And gives grace to the spiritual or the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due season, casting your cares over on the Lord. Let's go on. Now listen to this. It says, he's blessed you with every blessing. So what does Satan want to take from you? He wants to keep you from getting your hands on all those blessings. Why? Because they're deposited in you like seed. And the seed has to germinate. And it has to develop. So he comes and prods and bangs and whacks. Hoping you get your eyes off what God has already given you. Onto you defending your life and your breath. Because you're a human. Hey, you were supposed to die. Why are you defending yourself? Good Good question. Should a person who's dead get up out of their coffin and argue with their mother? <laughs> Thought I'd give you a funny thing. Right? You are dead in Christ, but alive unto God. So if you're dead unto Christ, then nobody can insult you, right? Nobody's going to get your goad because a dead man's dead. Hey, you're an ugly dead man, Carrie. You're an ugly, ugly, ugly. Your mother wears army boots. And your dad was this and this. Might bother me any. You got a problem. People that get on your case really have the problem. Sometimes it's what they think you're thinking. Not necessarily what you're doing. Don't be like that. Because every man's tempted when he's drawn away from his relationship with God into other things. Doesn't matter what it is. Anything but God. So it goes on, it says, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that he might be, that we might be holy, set apart, and without blame before him in love. You're set apart for God, and you're without blame. So those of you that are very young in the Lord, you're going to make plenty of mistakes. Did you throw your kid out when he fell over and knocked over your coffee cup? That little kid that pooped his pants, you throw him out there? No, you hug him and you love him. Why would you think God is any lesser when we do wrong? Oh, we have to feel guilty when we do wrong. Listen, you got God living on this side of you. The moment you do something wrong, you're going to know. But without guilt and condemnation from outside, you'll have a healthy feeling on the inside. So let's work with that son. Let's work with that daughter. No condemnation involved. Why? Because he's going to walk you out of this life. And he can't have the sheep nervous and run from the pastor. If he's a shepherd of the sheep. The Lord is my shepherd. What? I shall not want. He maketh me to lay down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside still waters. And folks. He restoreth our soul. Has you ever had your mind just kind of weighed down? 
Spend that time with God. Let the refreshing, let his word, what I'm sharing with you, this encouraging word to you, not because it's me, because it encourages you. And Jesus says, now, but through the word that I've spoken unto you, you are washed, you're cleansed. You know what it's like after you worked really hard with a nice, warm, wet shower and soap does? That's you when you meet with God. He's washing you. He's cleansing you. He's removing all the self-condemning things that we have. Those little fibs that we tell that we wish we didn't. Why would you have to say that, Pastor Gary? It's IRS time. <laughs> Come on, smile at me. Next week, Scott's going to preach. <clears throat> he probably would too. And that's wonderful. One day that all of you be able to preach and to share the proper way so people realize hey, why am I doing what I'm doing? God is so much cooler. So much better. Now you got Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. So much better than, so much better than, so much better than. Jesus is the focus. This is my son. Pay attention to him. He'll bring you to the Father. Can you say amen? All right. So he goes on. Having predestinated us to be adopted as sons and daughters by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. It's God's good pleasure to love you. Good pleasure for the joy that was set before him. And then it goes on and it says, So we are not to be put any more trust in our flesh. Can you say amen? In fact, if you read a lot of the scripture, Paul says, you know, I, I knew Jesus, but I know him no more after the flesh. I knew the apostles but now I don't look them anymore after the flesh. I look at, after the spirit, what God is doing in them. It's so easy to look at somebody and see their faults. Any dummy can do that. In fact, Satan works hard to get you to see them. That's so you can pray and love them. Not so you can make conversation with them. Come as you are, folks. When we come to God every day, we come as we are. Can you say amen? Don't take a shower first. You know, don't brush your teeth first. Come as you are and say, Lord, you see me. This is my, all my glory in the flesh. Now pulverize it. Can you say amen? Amen. I want to tell you, I really had, just to be honest, I had a pretty rough, rough day yesterday. Things weren't going right. People promised things and things and not keeping their word. And I said, Lord, I need to talk to you. And he says, yeah. Because it was starting to bother me. And so I went to him and he says, Son, it bothers me too when people promise th me things and don't do them. But I forgive them instantly because I love them so. He says, you do the same. I thought, what an idea! That spoke to somebody. Somebody needed to hear that. Forgive how much God has forgiven you. Right? All right. And finishing. So we come to Jesus how often? Every day, sometimes all during the day, I acknowledge him throughout the day. He says, trust in the Lord, lean not to your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge that he's there by addressing him, and he will direct your steps. There's a formula, if you want to call it a formula. First of all, trust. How many know the difference between faith and trust? How many thought it was the same thing? You see, faith is you putting your faith in God. Trust is settling down on God's faith and letting him carry you to heaven. Trust is when he said, go to the other sides, boys. And the winds are blowing and everything. Oh, we perish. And Jesus come walking on the water. He says, peace be still. Didn't I tell you you were going to the other side? How many here plan on making heaven your home? You're going to the other side. So stop looking at the waves. Stop listening to the roaring of stuff. It's there. But God says, you're going where? 
Now that in the New Testament, Jesus gets in the boat to just to show them how much they're trusting their own faith instead of trusting what God said. Are we having our faith in what God said? Or are we settling down and believing God is who he says he is? God will do what he says he will do. And he is perfect in his ways concerning you. Whew. Man, if I had a flag, I'd wave it. Now, what's the devil going to give you? What's the world going to offer? It took me a long time to figure some of this stuff out, so I want you to do it before me. Get, I want you to be better Christian me than myself. I want you to understand these things so that you and your children, maybe your grandchildren, will survive in this mess people are making. Guaranteed, any time man gets involved in something, it could become a mess. That's why we need God. Are you with me? Okay, I want to talk to you about three things real quickly. Number one, we're going to talk about the ten lepers. Remember the story of the ten lepers? Number two, the woman with the issue of blood. I'm just going to talk about them, not read all of it. And then finally, one of my favorites, the story of blind Bartimaeus. How many remember any of those stories? There's some things that Jesus... See, everything that's in the Bible is there for our learning, for us to practice and get things right. Okay? So the story of the ten lepers is really a story that leprosy is a cause of the sin of the flesh. In the Jewish mindset, if you were a leper, you committed the unpardonable sin. And you were told to stay away from everybody... And if you got anywhere close, you had to yell, I'm unclean, I'm unclean. So the Jewish religion puts people in boxes. Religion will put you in a category. Satan's a master saying, oh, you're one of those, and you're one of these. You're black, you're white. He works that way so that none of us can unify. Because we all become suspicious of one another. You, you with me? So, here we have the leopards. So, the leopards came to Jesus and says, you, you can if you will. You could cleanse us. And Jesus said, I will. And then he touched them. He broke the law. Remember, not all of the law was written by God. Some, maybe two-thirds, were written by man thinking they were writing for God. And so, if you had an issue of blood, if you were blind, you were infirm in any way, shape, or form, if you died and somehow rose again, you were taboo, don't go near you, don't touch you. How is a person going to get saved? Such religious thought like that. Some people, the Jews, called them dogs. And one woman says, yeah, but us dogs still eat the crumbs that fall off of you guys' table. And Jesus was just stricken by her faith and healed her. You see, when we become religious, we'll turn everyone off. But when we become a humble child of God that loves God, gets soaked with his presence so we can love others, then people will flock to you. They won't be coming just to see your house. They'll be actually to come to see you. <laughs> Wouldn't that be nice? They didn't come to borrow money. They came to actually hear some advice from you. Someone say amen. amen. All right. I'm pretty much done. So the ten lepers, as they came, Jesus healed them, right? And as they left, they gave glory to God. But what happened? Only one returned to give God the glory. What did God say to that man? He says, the others are cleansed, but you, because you gave thanks, I make whole. Message to us. We thank him for being such a good God. We praise him for working on our life. But how much do we actually tell him we're in love with him and we appreciate him? Because that time when you do that with him, he'll make you whole. Let's move on down to the woman with the issue of blood. 
This woman sought every kind of position you can imagine. She was a wealthy woman, but she spent all that she had. And nothing got better. The scripture warns us in Jeremiah 17, 5, through 5 and 6, if you trust in the arm of flesh alone, then you'll be like a rambling bush over in eastern Washington gets caught in a fence. But he who trusts in the Lord, that's the difference. So this woman realized that man could do nothing, but she heard about Jesus. You see, that's why Satan tries to make the church religious. Because we share religion and it turns people off from wanting to see Jesus. People come for Jesus. I hope you came today for what Jesus will come out of me. You see, you're praying that Jesus will come out of me. And not just Carrie's opinion. Can you say amen? And she said that she heard about Jesus. And because she was infirm that she was bleeding to death through a menstrual thing. She literally is crawling on her hands and knees saying. Now when you read that, the Greek says she never stops saying. If I touch him, if I touch him, then we're going to reach up and touch him. He's right there. Oh, I'm just going to touch his hand. What I just got. And that's how desperate she was. And she reached up despite all of the religious confusion and touched the hem of his garment. And virtue left Jesus right where faith was. You get up in the morning, do you meet God in faith? In trust? Do you touch his garment? Or do you give up trying to break through the crowds? And she touches God. And what Jesus says, Jesus stood still. And he says, who touched me? Who touched me? And his disciples, bless their darn little pea-picking heart. Everybody's touching you, Jesus. What do you mean? Who's touching you? Didn't they do something like that when Jesus says, go feed the multitude? Hey, go feed them yourself. Flesh. She touched, he says, because I know somebody touched me in faith, virtue has gone out of me. Folks, when I pray for the sick, I wait for virtue to leave me because I know it's the God in me that heals them, not my little hanny. Can you say amen? And I'm trying to teach the congregation how to have faith in the pew, not run to the hand. Because there's a lot of game playing and running to the hand. If I wanted to, I could stand you up and point my finger and knock you down. But what good is that? Do you understand? That's like using a firecracker just to make noise. The power of God is designed to kill cancer, heal sick, cause people to be saved. And I don't want to be a wasteful Christian that gives out my pearls before the swine. Not, I'm not referring to you. But running around bragging about God and then having to keep up with it. God told me in this last part of my journey my journey, that he was going to build the house. He was going to bring the people. I'm not to advertise. I'm just to focus on giving out good word. Giving every opportunity my wife and I can for you to get good word. So one day when we all get to heaven, God might one day all bring us together and say, yeah, we all church together. Wow, that was so cool. I remember this. I remember that. You see. Instead of, you know, focusing on the negatives. All right, and finishing. So we got to the ten lepers. Just a little bit about the woman with the issue of blood. Sure, I could, I could spend two weeks teaching on it. But then finally, to one of my favorites, blind Bartimaeus. Remember the story? The disciples came to Jesus and they said, This man, that he was born blind. Whose fault was this, Jesus? Was this his parents? fault that they sinned that he was born blind or was it something he did Jesus that he was born blind what was Jesus's answer neither period and yet still people are saying, oh yeah God did that so Jesus could heal him man you got God in a bad light sounds like you're describing the devil don't describe the devil thinking it's God Everything bad that happens in this planet, either we did it or the enemy did it, had nothing to do with God. So you got somebody who's blaming God for a death. They lost their mom or something. You can help them 
not blame God. Can you say amen? God receives them. God takes them home when, they, when something happens. But he does not snatch them before their time. Are you still with me? Blind Bartimaeus. So blind Bartimaeus heard that Jesus heals. Yet he had never seen Jesus. Get it? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> you guys are religious. Let's sack that religion and let's get on with it. He heard about Jesus, but he never saw Jesus. So what did he do? He could hear the crowds, and he knew that Jesus was coming. So he screams, Jesus, have mercy on me. And naturally, the religious people come right around. Shh, shh, don't bother the man. Jesus is busy. Sounds like my dad working on his Volkswagen. Didn't want to bother God with a spark plug. God's so busy, you know. <laughs> God is so busy, and yet he's so personal, there isn't a thing like your hair falling out that he doesn't know. You can even drool on yourself at night when you're sleeping without him knowing it. You're sleeping in God, folks. When are we going to wake up to that fact? You're sleeping, walking, talking in God. He came at Pentecost and filled the atmosphere that you and I breathe. And the only way we have access to that is because we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ into our heart. And because we have, we have a magnet to draw spiritual things to our spirit and our flesh tries to resist it. So therefore, whatever a man soweth, so shall he reap. If you sow of the flesh, you shall of the flesh reap corruption. But if you sow to your spirit man, you shall of the spirit man reap life everlasting. Right in the face of Satan, he can't do a thing about it. It's like God saying, nah, 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 nah. <sighs> Exactly. And Satan can't do a thing about it. But see, it's when we stick our ugly muggly out, that he punches us. Because we're doing it for God. I'm not listening anymore, Carrie. I'm shutting it off. Well, you like darkness? Turn the light off. The last one leave. Turn the light off. No, can you see? Man? Some of you guys don't remember 1973 and Carter, our president, when he said to Boeing, last one out, turn the lights off. Don't trust flesh to run your country. Trust the God people who pray and follow him. All right. So blind Bartimaeus, all these disciples came over. Don't yell, don't yell, you're bothering Jesus. What did he do? He yelled all the louder, Mike. Jesus, have mercy on me. You read the account, it says Jesus stood still. And it says, bring that man to me. Where are you at? Are you just whimpering your prayers? Are you crying out for God? To change your life circumstances. Do. Don't sit there and say, well, it's just, it's just a lot that I have to live for heaven's sakes. It isn't. How about this one? It's the curse of the fourth generation revisited to the children. How many ever heard that one? Do you realize that's incorrect? That's Old Testament. How many sins did God forgive you? So if he's forgiven all your sins, the lie that... These evil spirits are going to follow you through your generations. It's just a door for Satan to use to harass you. Huh? Well, what are they? We know there's generational curses. They're right there in the scripture. Yeah, it's called an evil spirit. The curse follows the family members. Like, for example, drinking. We'll follow a family member, maybe ruin their life, and then get on the kids, the grandkids. And they think, I'm never going to drink my life. And then you end up being an alcoholic. He keeps following and following. That isn't a curse from God. That's an evil spirit. Bind it up and cast it away from your family. It's an addictive spirit. will addict you to something. Doesn't even have to be drugs or alcohol. It could be food. It could be guilt. It could be self-pity. These are all of the flesh. And we are to do what with our flesh? 
I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God, who gave and died self for me. Who did he die for? He died for me. He died for you. Yes, Jesus, he lives in you. So I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ that liveth in me. You see, when he lives, you live. When you live, you have problems. Let him be preeminent. One more thought. Jesus stood still and he said to Joe, bring him to me. Then what did he say to blind Bartimaeus? What is it you want me to do for you? Listen to that. Jesus is saying to that man, what is it that you want me to do for you? That's a message to you folks. What is it that you cry out for? that you want God to do for you? Make you whole? Heal your family? Help you on the job? Maybe you have a flaw that you're not happy about, but God still loves you. Maybe it's a flaw he can help you with. Don't, please don't ask me to bring them up. <clears throat> I have enough of my own, right? But that precious time with our creator, Bible says that any man be in Christ, he's a what? New creature or new creation or species of being. Did you know a born again believer has never ever been on this planet before? You are the first of all godly species. God made Adam and Eve, but they weren't born again. They were just alive. But you and I were dead. But we accepted Jesus Christ and we became alive. Not only that, but God took out the Adamic nature out of our spirit. All the sin, all the, the death nature right out of there. And he put his very nature in. Father, Son, Holy Spirit came in. And mixed us all together in our spirit. So you're a walking new creation. Churning and walking. For it is God in you to do his good work and his good pleasure. He has begun a good work in you. will finish that work. Can you say unto the day of your salvation? So basically you're to live your Christianity from your gut out. Slow down your silly talking. You're overthinking. And ask God to help you just smooth out your strut. Smooth out your flow. And watch the blessings just come sticking to you. Because people will see that your life is stable. Your life is solid. You're not a flake anymore. We sent all the flakes to Eastern Washington. You know, the granola workers. You know what those are? Fruit, nuts, and flakes. Ha, ha, ha. All right. So listen. Every one of us are a champion because who lives in us? Remember, that's your source. Every one of us are potential dummies because we have what? The flesh. So every day, our responsibility, I always look over this side, you know. So I'm at his right hand. <laughs> you lay your flesh down so that when he puts it back on you, it's sanctified, it's set apart, it doesn't resist you. By the end of the day, some of us, our flesh is starting to resist us. We're tired, we're wore out. Take a minute out and dump your bag. You know what you mean? How many here have a vacuum? Does it still have a bag in it? Uh, probably not. But some of them do, don't they? What happens when your bag gets full? Yeah, you're supposed to dump it, right? But Christians, your bag will get full and you go to sleep on it. Wake up with a headache next morning feeling kind of... So take the bag and say, Lord, all the stuff during the day I was exposed to good and bad... I wrap up in a vacuum cleaner bag. Just imagine yourself doing this. God works with pictures. What do you think words are for? So I'm telling you the way to do it. Wrap all that crud of the day. Wrap it up. And 
flip it over on the Lord and say, you can have it, Lord, sort it out. Meanwhile, I'm going to rest in you. Thank you that the plea of blood of Jesus over my dreams and over my body so I don't have another nightmare in my life. Thank you that you watch over my subconscious and you minister and you sing over me when I sleep. Now, words give God invitation. How did you get God from out here into here? Jarrell, how did you get God from out here into here? Shake grandma's hand? No. You asked him in, didn't you? So what should you do daily? Ask him to help you more. You're not getting saved, saved, saved again. No, you're getting cleansed, cleansed, cleansed again. And you're learning to take that little bag you sucked up during the day, the negatives and the gossip and something you heard. You know somebody needs to be doing something, but they won't do it. And they're ornery about it. You just wrap it all up, throw it over on the Lord, and have a nice sweet sleep as it is written. He gives his beloved sweet sleep who trusts in him. If you got something out of that this morning, will you give the Lord a praise? Now, we...